Hello, in this video, we're going to go over the problems from the unit three review um, so that as you are working through the review on your own, if you get stuck, you'll have some reference on how to complete those problems. Um, just to help you prepare adequately before you take the um, unit three test. So for number one, Excuse me, I had a quick visitor um, knock on the door as soon as I was about to start, so I paused the video. Um, so for number one, we have um, a set of inputs and a set of outputs, and it's asking us to determine whether the relationship or whether the relation represents y as a function of x. In order to view that, what you're looking for, the only time it is a no, is when two x values are the same, but the y values are different. That's really all you're looking for to, do, to say no, okay? If you don't find this specific situation, then the answer is automatically gonna be yes, okay? And for right now, what I do see is I see that the input x7 and 7 over here do have different y values, OK? So this is no, not a function, OK? You can't plug in an input and get two y values back out, OK? Um, but if you notice on number two, nothing, none of these x values repeat. So in this case, I don't have two x values that are the same, so I don't need to say no. I'm just going to say yes. And then for number three, it says find the function value if possible. And so for part A, it's asking me f of negative two. And if you see there on the screen, um, this is the function negative 5x minus 5 when x is less than negative 1, and then x squared plus 2x minus 1 when x is greater than or equal to negative 1. And so since my x value in here is a negative 2, that means I'm going to be in the top section of this function. Why? Because my x value is less than negative 1. Okay, so I'm going to plug that negative two into the negative five X minus five. And then that would be positive 10 minus five, which is five. And so I will type in five in this box. Then F of negative one, I need to decide which function to use. Now they both have negative one, but one of them does not include the negative one and the other one does include negative one. So the function that includes negative one is the one I'm going to choose to plug in the negative one. And we get negative two. So here we're trying to plug in the x value one. So I'm gonna look at my bounds again and decide where does one live? Does one live in this restriction or does it live in the bottom restriction, okay? Because that will tell me whether to use the top function or the bottom function. In this case, um, it turns out that positive one is actually bigger than negative one, right? So I live in this um, restriction, which means I'm going to be plugging in one into the bottom function. So I'm going to say 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 1, 1 plus 2 minus 1, which is a positive 2. OK, now number, oh, that was all number 3. It was not number 4. Number 4, we're about to get to now. So for number 4, it says find the domain of the function. Now, the domain is always all real numbers 
unless you have a fraction or a radical. Later, we'll learn about a different restriction with logarithms, but that's not until the very last unit in this course, okay? For now, we only have two restrictions on domain, and that's that your denominators cannot equal zero and your radicands inside the radical cannot be negative, okay? We don't have any fractions or radicals in this function, so we don't have any restrictions on our domain, which means that our domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. And my hand just did something weird right there. But there you go, negative infinity to infinity. So what happens when my brain hesitates. Okay, so that's the same thing as saying all real numbers. Right, everything between negative infinity to infinity. Now, number five is a little different story though, because number five actually has, um, one, it's a function in terms of y instead of in terms of x, which is okay, but it's just not what we're used to, right? Um, but the other thing is that um, I have a radical in this problem, an even radical, okay? So we know that when this little index right here, when this little guy is even, we know that that automatically means that the radicand, the y plus seven on the inside, cannot be negative, which means it can be equal to zero or it could be positive, which is greater than zero. And so if I subtract seven on both sides, I obtain the restriction that y must be greater than or equal to negative seven. And so that would actually be the bottom option. Now six, six does have a radical, so it should cause me to have alarm, okay? I should be going, oh, radical. Hmm, I don't know if that one has a restriction on the domain or not, okay? But in this case, because you have an odd index, that means that you don't have a restriction on your radicand. You can take the cube root of negative numbers, you could take the cube root of zero, and you could take the cube root of positive numbers. Um, there's no restriction when you're doing odd roots. So in this case, the domain is gonna be, again, negative infinity to infinity, or here's a, the mathematical way we write all real numbers. But that literally is the same thing as saying all real numbers. It's just, it's basically an R with an extra leg over here. And this little bubble extends to that extra leg. Okay. What I usually do is I usually do two things like this and then just draw my R starting from that guy like that. Okay. Um, but that's the symbol that we use, mathematicians use for all real numbers. Um, and then number seven is also a domain problem, but this one is that other case that we were talking about when you have um, a fraction. So when you have a refraction, you do have restrictions. You have restrictions on your denominator. Your denominator cannot equal zero, okay? So in this case, that means that x squared minus 2x cannot equal 0. Or if I factor it and I solve for x, I get that x cannot equal 0 and x minus 2 cannot equal 0, which is the same thing as saying x cannot equal positive 2, All right? If I add 2 on both sides. So I have two, two numbers that x cannot be. So what this means is the domain is all real numbers except these two guys, zero and two, okay? And so I do have a statement in there. Oh, I forgot to click on this response. And here it would be all real numbers except zero and two. So it would be this one. Here, this one has negative two, which is not even a restriction of value. Here it has two, but just the two. And here it has zero, but just the zero. And then here it has zero, but then it has a negative two, and that's not the correct value, right? Okay, now we're getting a little more complicated with eight and number nine. They're doing some double whammies there, right? They have radicals and fractions. So we have to consider what's going on in those situations, okay? 
So in these situations, you have two things to consider. One is that we know We know that if this is an even, which it is, mm -hmm, then that means that the radicand has to be greater than or equal to two. But we also know that the denominator cannot equal two or cannot equal zero, I'm sorry. So if I minus two on all of these parts, I will get X has to be greater than or equal to negative two, but X cannot equal negative two. So if I put these two statements together, if this is saying greater or equal, but this is saying not equal, then together it means X can just be greater than negative two, okay? It can't actually be negative two because then it makes the denominator zero, okay? So um, I think that is an option in here. It is this one right there. Then now number nine, we have F of X equal to x minus two over the square root of x. So here we know that the inside of that radical, because it is a square root, has to be greater than or equal to zero. But then I also know that the whole denominator cannot equal zero. Now here, if I square both sides, I get that x cannot equal zero. So then I have these two statements, kind of like what we had up here, and if I try to put these two statements together, I get that X has to just be greater than zero because it cannot actually equal zero. And one more of these combinations. So hopefully this helps you be prepared. Um, so in this case, we know that, um, again, X minus six, the inside has to be greater than or equal to zero, but the whole thing, the whole denominator cannot equal zero. So over here, you could square both sides again. You get X minus six cannot equal zero or X cannot equal positive six. Um, and over here, if you add six over, you get X has to be greater than or equal to six. So if you put these two statements together, you get that X must just be greater than six. Okay, now number 11. Oops, G of X equals X squared minus 10X. It says one, put the quadratic function in its standard form, okay? So I basically need to complete the square. So I'm going to have to add half of negative 10 squared. And then I'm going to have to subtract that same value so that I'm not changing the value of my uh, function. If these were cancel out, leaving me with what I started with, right? But what does that really do? So this becomes plus negative 5 squared minus negative 5 squared. And then negative five times negative five is actually a positive 25, but I got this minus here, and then that's a positive 25. Now the first three, the whole point of us adding this was so that we could factor these first three terms, but we had to also subtract this number so that it's not changing the value of the original function. So when I factor this, I get X minus five times X minus five, this guy is going to hang off to the side. And then that can be written as X minus five squared. Or you can follow the shortcut. Whatever you got inside this square is exactly what goes behind the minus, the X, okay? If that was a positive five, then this would be plus five, okay? So you don't necessarily have to do this step. Um, you can just go straight from the trinomial to the factors using the fact that whatever's in that parentheses will go inside this parentheses with the X. Basically just put an X in front of it. Unless it's positive, then you have to do X plus, right? Okay, so this is the function in its standard form. This is what they wanted in there. So I'm gonna do X minus five 
raised to the two minus 25. And then what does that mean? That means that the vertex will actually be at the positive value opposite of this and the exact same sign as that. So my vertex should be here. Um, so positive five and negative 25. Positive five and negative 25 would be this parabola down here. Um, and then it says, The vertex, we already figured it out, five comma negative 25. Axes of symmetry is always going to be x equals whatever x value was there. This is the axes of symmetry. Okay, so here it would be x equals five. And then the x-intercept, you can find the x-intercepts by, um, setting the original or the one in standard form, I would go with the one in standard form, setting it equal to zero and then solving for X. So in this case, if I wanted to find the X intercepts, I would take X minus five squared minus 25 and equal it to zero. Then I would add the 25 over. Then I would take the square root of both sides so I get x minus five by itself and plus or minus, and the square root of 25 is five. So I would end up with x equals plus or minus five, and if I add that over, plus five. So five plus five is 10, and negative five plus five is zero. And so those are the two x-intercepts that I get. Um, so they want them both, and notice that they want the smaller x value first. So zero comma something, and then 10 comma something. Now, in order for me to figure out that y value, I am going to have to plug it into the function. So I'm gonna say g of zero and then g of 10. So if I go back to the original, it's just gonna be zero squared minus 10 times zero. Um, and here, zero, um, or not zero squared, 10 squared, minus 10 times 10, zero minus zero is zero, 100 minus another 100 is also zero. And so there we go. We've got those values in there. Now, let's go ahead and repeat it, but with a different function, okay? Now this problem is kind of silly because I already did. Um, but if you notice in this one, it's already factorable. It's already got three terms and it's already a perfect square. Um, if you don't recognize it or you just want to have one method that works always, we can keep repeating the same thing we did in the last process. So in case this is not perfect, like it is here, all you do is keep the first two terms here and kick this one off to the side, okay? Then you're gonna do that same thing we did before where you're gonna add one half of this positive 10 and then square it, but then you also have to minus this one half of positive 10 squared, okay? And since you have this extra number in there, instead of putting these right next to each other, you just have this guy in the middle, right? So then what happens is I get x squared plus 10x. This is five squared, which is 25. Over here, you have your plus 25 minus a 25. And then you'll notice what happens is that these two cancel away and you literally have the exact same thing that you started with. So yeah, it is a little bit of extra work if you don't recognize it, but it still plays out as it should, okay? And so what ends up happening is I get zero over here, but this does still factor into X and this is positive five, so X plus five squared. So when I wanna pick out the vertex, I'm gonna take the opposite of inside the parentheses and the same sign as outside the parentheses. Um, so negative five, zero. 
Remember that the axis of symmetry is at x equals whatever this x value is, so negative five in this case. Um, and then if I wanna know the x-intercepts, we'll set the whole function equal to zero. I always take the factored version equal to zero. So you have um, x plus five squared plus zero equal to zero. And then you would move this over but it's still equal zero. Then you would take the square root and you would get x plus five equals plus or minus zero, but it doesn't matter. It's still zero. And so you just get x equals to negative five. So what is my intercept? It's gonna be negative five for x and zero for y. If you don't believe me, plug in this negative five. into your original function. What do you get? You get positive 25. Here you get negative 50 and positive 25, which does give you zero, this y value. Okay, so let's type everything in there. So it's gonna be x plus five squared, oops. And then the, the vertex was at negative five zero, so it's this option. And then the vertex negative five comma zero, x equals negative five, and negative five comma zero. Okay, we've got all the information we need for that one. Now, number 13. So number 13 says, write the standard form of a quadratic function whose graph is a parabola with the given vertex um, and passes through the given point. Let x be the independent variable, let y be the dependent variable. So we get, um, we get y equals x minus h squared plus k. So in this case, I was given the vertex, so x minus two squared plus negative four um, which can be written as x minus two squared minus four. Um, and it does have, oh, and there sometimes is a number in front here, right? Um, but I don't know what that number is right now. However, I can use the other point to figure out that number. So if I use the point negative two comma 60, this is telling me in an x value and a y value that's on the graph. So that means y would be 60 a, I don't know, but X is negative two. And so I'm gonna add four on both sides to help me solve this. Negative two minus two is negative four. And when I square that, I get 16. And when I divide by 16 on both sides, I get that four equals A. And this is great because that's all I was missing in my equation. I, my equation will now be a equals four times x minus two squared minus four. Remember in your standard form, you need to know this number, you need to know this number, and you need to know this number. You need to find those three numbers. This is just the template for those three values. Okay, so once you have the A, the H, and the K, that is the equation that they're looking for. So Y equals four, parentheses, X minus four, oops, X minus two, squared, minus four. Okay, number 14. So number 14 says the profit in hundreds of dollars that a company makes depends on the amount X in hundreds of dollars the company spends on advertising according to the model. What expenditure for ad advertising yields a maximum profit? So this is number um, 14, I think it was. Yes. And my function is P equals 150 plus 90X 
minus 0.5x squared. First of all, it's not in the right order. So I'm gonna fix the order of it and then my positive 150. And if I'm talking about the maximum or the minimum, either one, you are talking about the vertex, okay? So I need to calculate the vertex here. Now the formula for the vertex is negative V over 2A, and then your function evaluated at that value, okay? So I need to figure out what negative V over 2A is. And now that it's in the correct order, I can pick out B is a positive 90, and then A is a negative 0 0.5, which means I end up with the positive 90 as my response, okay? Now it does say what expenditure for advising yields this maximum, okay? And X is the cost of the advising, advertising. So X is really what they're asking me for. So it's going to be nine, well, remember this is 90 hundreds of dollars, right? But notice over here in the box, it just says dollars, okay? So what is 90 hundreds of dollars? Well, what is 90 times 100? We get $9,000. Okay, so nine, oops. There we go. Now number 15 says, use the graph of the function to find the domain and the range, okay? So for domain, domain is going to be um, all of your X values. So when we're scanning the graph, we're gonna go from left to right. So transpose every single point on this graph onto the X axis, okay? And then you're basically writing down what it fills up, okay? So if I transpose everything onto the X axis, what I'm gonna have is, you know, this one will come down here. All of those points in between um, will come down, 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 filling this all up, including this part, even past this part, the stuff at the bottom will go up and fill it all up. Um, and then it ends where I think like two more marks this way, but it has a solid dot, okay? And so notice that it covered your number line from that number to that number. So your domain is gonna be from this number, which is negative two and a parentheses, cause there's an open dot up until that number, which is a positive two, but because it's a closed dot, it should have a bracket. So the domain here is going to be sets and I want one that is, looks like that, negative two comma two. Okay, now the range is the same similar thing, but this time you're gonna transpose all of your values onto the Y axis. So here's five, one more, you've got the white dot over here on the left, that's gonna go over here, okay? And then as you trace all those other Y values over, it's going to fill up this whole entire number line. Even the values down here, right? If you transpose all these, they're going to fill this up, okay? Same thing here. If you transpose all the ones on the right over, they're going to fill up that same amount, okay? And then this solid dot will get transposed. It'll actually fill the open dot, okay? And then that's one, two, three, okay? So how do you write the range? The range is gonna be the set of Y values. And it looks like the set of Y values for this particular problem are from here to here, which is from negative three to six. That has a solid dot, so it's a bracket. Now this one, although there was no big giant solid dot telling you that that's where it ends, a graph, consists of nothing but solid dots, okay? And so when you transpose all of these dots over here, they are solid dots, even the very last bottom one. 
is a solid dot. So because it's solid, you're gonna put a bracket at that negative three. Okay, so here they're asking us for function values. Remember, these are x's and they're asking me for the y. So when x is negative one, the graph is down here and that y value is actually negative three. When x is zero, my x is here, but the graph is down there and that y value is negative two. And then f of one, here's where x is equal to one, but if I go to the graph, it's down there, and that y value is a negative three. Here, x equals positive two, the graph exists up here, and that y value is a positive six. Okay, number 16 says to, um, use the vertical line test. So if I draw just one vertical line right here, um, right through four, you'll notice that it touches the graph two times, okay? When it does that, it's not a function, okay? It can only touch the graph once or not at all. Now here, same thing. If I do the vertical line test, it never goes through the graph twice. If I'm on this side of the x equals zero, it only crosses through each thing once. And if I'm on this side, it only crosses through once. There is nothing at zero. So you cross nothing if you were to draw a line right on top of the y-axis. So this one is yes, it is a function. Each vertical line that I imagine, every single one that I could possibly imagine on this graph will never touch that graph more than one time. So it is a function. Now, 18 wants us to find the quote unquote zeros of this function. We've heard that word quite a bit now. Um, what it means is it means take this function and equal it to zero, okay? And then solve. So I do have common factors. I have um, x squared in common. So I get negative x squared plus four. And then if I set this factor equal to zero, I also have to set this factor equal to zero. Now here, I would just take the square root of both sides. And although I get plus or minus, zero is just zero, okay? Now over here, I would have to minus the four over. Then I would have to divide the negative nine. So it would become negative four over negative nine and the negative and the negatives will cancel. So it's actually positive four ninths. Then I would take the square root and I do get plus or minus and the square root of four is two and the square root of nine is three. And so we get these three X values or zeros. So we got zero, we got two thirds and we got negative two thirds. Number 19 says determine the intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant, okay? Um, now increasing, if I trace the graph starting from the far left, it's actually going downward until it gets here. So because there's no actual solid dot, I'm gonna assume that that goes forever, you know, forever up, but also forever to the left. And if it's going forever, it's eventually going to go to negative infinity. So I'm going to say that this is um, negative infinity, comma, up until it gets to this value, which was the x value of 1. Then from there, it starts to increase, increase, increase. Okay, so starting at 1, it starts increasing, but notice it goes up and to the right forever. So then I'm gonna use the positive infinity. And it's never constant. So as far as sets are concerned, we're just gonna type in the empty set. Oh no, it says enter, do not enter. 
or does not exist. Okay, now, same thing here. So when I trace it from left to right, this is going up. I'm gonna assume that's going forever to the left. So negative symbol infinity comma, and it stops going up until it gets here. That X value is zero. Then from zero, it's constant until it gets to the X value two. So that means this part would be this. Then from there, it jumps up here, okay? And then it goes, and that X value up there is still a two. Oh, but it's increasing again. So notice it's going up some more. So that means over here, I need to put another set. So I'm gonna put union, and then I'm gonna put from this X value two, and it does go up, but more importantly, it goes to the right forever. So it's gonna be two comma infinity. And it doesn't ever decrease, so it's gonna be does not exist. You have to trace it from left to right. If you don't chase it from, chase it, trace, not chase. If you don't trace it from left to right, you will not get the correct directions, like increasing or decreasing. Okay, these ones want me to check, sketch the graph. So in order for me to do that, I have to make a chart and graph it. And then I just pick which graph matches mine, okay? So I'm going to make a chart for the top function, and then I'm going to make a chart for the bottom function. And because three is part of the interval, I'm going to have to put three on both. But for the top function, it has the bar, so it'll have a solid dot. The bottom function does not have a bar, so it will have an open dot. All the other numbers will just have regular dots, okay? regular tiny solid dots. Now, if I plug in numbers that are less than three, excuse me, into the top function, we'll get four and five. And so if I plug those in there, let's see what we get. Um, one there, one minus four minus two squared. I get negative three. And then let me do it again, but with the five, negative eight, and I totally forgot to do it with um, three. I get zero. Now I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna plug in three and now big numbers that are bigger than three. Oh, I did the wrong thing. I was, so for this function, I was supposed to pick X values that were less than three, but four and five are not less than three. Four and five are bigger than three, right? Less than three would be two and one. So if I plug in two, I get one. And if I plug in one, I get zero. Okay. Now over here, we're gonna plug in numbers that are bigger than three, so four and five, and we're gonna plug them into this. So three minus three, I get zero. Now I'm gonna change the first three to a four. I get one. And then I'm gonna change it to a five. I get square root of two, which is approximately 1.4. So when I graph this, I'm gonna mark one, two, three, four, five and three and zero with a big solid dot, two and one with a regular dot, um, one and zero Oh, I see what I did. I plotted these all wrong. All my coordinates are wrong. Hello. Three and zero is one, two, three for X and zero for Y. 
then two and one does go there, regular dot. And then one and zero for y goes here. So it's like going like this, okay? Now it does go forever, I, even after one, it goes to zero, negative one, negative two. So it's just gonna keep going in this direction, okay? It's a parabola, but it's gonna get chopped off on this side. There's no rest of the parabola going this way. Um, now for us doing this one, we're gonna plug in three and zero, but with an open dot, but it really don't matter because that solid dot that was already there fills it in. Then four and one, and then five and 1.4 something. Now this is the square root function. So it has a curve to it, but it goes like that. Okay. So we're essentially looking for the graph that has this shape. And I think it's that very first one. Yep, the others are not the correct directions. And this one has the parabola on this side and the square root function on that side, which is the opposite of what we had going on. Okay, now let's look at number 22. Number 22 has these points and I'm just gonna write the points. Negative six, negative four, negative three, zero, zero, five, three, zero, and then six, negative four, okay? And for part A, they're asking them to do y equals f of x minus one. What this is gonna do is it's going to shift right one unit. What does that mean for my coordinates? It means I'm going to add one to each of my x coordinates. So I'm going to take negative six and I'm going to add one. I'm gonna take negative three, zero, three, and six. And to all of these, I'm going to add one. And the y value, I am not doing anything to that. And so what are gonna be my new coordinates? That's gonna be negative five comma negative four, negative two comma zero, one comma five, four comma zero, and seven comma negative four. And so we're gonna find the graph that matches that information. So negative five, negative four, that's too far over there. Um, negative two and zero, nope, I definitely don't have anything there. This one has negative two and zero and four and zero. Negative five, negative four, zero and, oh no, it says one and five, then four and zero, and then seven and negative four. Yes, so I think it is this one. Now for part B, I'm gonna flip over to the other page. For part V, there's two transformations that are happening. Okay, now you do have to apply that one at a time and always apply the multiplication first before you do the addition. So what is this multiplication gonna do? If I wanna do that, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the signs of all Y values. So then that one point that was, um, where'd it go? Negative six, negative four is now gonna be the opposite of negative four, which is actually negative six and then positive four now. Here we had negative three comma zero, but now I'm gonna make that the opposite of zero, but there's no such thing as negative zero, so it's still zero. Then the point zero comma five, but I'm gonna make this negative. So I get the coordinates zero, negative five. Um, the coordinates three comma zero. Same thing, if I make this y value negative, it's still three comma zero. 
And then the last one, six comma negative four. Again, if I have a double negative, that's gonna turn this into six and positive four, okay? And then we'll look for the graph of that. Now I'm looking for zero and negative five, the one in the middle. So zero and negative five. Oh, I'm not done yet, that's why, because I have two transformations, right? Not only did I have to do that, but then I also have to add three. I have to make this go up, okay? So when you take this function, it's gonna shift this one up three units. What does that do? That means I'm gonna take all of these coordinates and I'm gonna add three to their Y values so that it can shift up. And so I get negative six comma seven, negative three comma three, zero comma negative two, um, three comma three, and six comma seven. So let's find the graph with these points, these final points after both transformations. I'm gonna look for zero negative two. That's not this graph. Zero negative two, not this graph. Nope, zero and negative two, it's this one. I just checked the y-intercept. Now let's look at C. It says y equals one third f of x. And if it's out here, what it's gonna do is it's gonna vertically shrink. How is that gonna affect my points? It's going to multiply your y coordinates by one third. So it's one third times the first y coordinate, which was negative four. Then one third times the next y coordinate, which is zero. Then the next y coordinate. Oh, I keep writing negative six, negative three, zero. Um, positive three and then positive six. Oh, this one should have been negative four. No, it was four. It was positive four. It changed to positive four. I forgot. But this one should be negative four. So we get negative six and negative four thirds, which is about negative six and negative 1.3. This one is gonna give you negative three and zero times anything is still zero. This is gonna give you zero and negative five thirds, which is about negative or zero and negative 1.7. Um, this one gives you three and zero, six and negative four thirds, which is a probably, which is about approximately um, six and one third, negative 1.3. And so I'm gonna look for these um, points here. So I'm gonna look for the one in the middle. It's usually the first one I look for is zero and negative 1.7. So it looks like this one is the only one that's even close, right? And then if I check the other points, negative six and one, negative 1.3. Oh, here it is. Oh, wait, I think I made a mistake. Oh, yes, this should have been positive five. The original y values were negative four, zero, five, zero, and negative four. So one third times that would be a positive five over three, 
which would be a positive 1.7. And that fits this one. So positive 1.7 and y when zero for x, negative six and negative 1.3, negative three and zero, positive three and zero, and then six and negative 1.3. So it's this graph right there. Now for D. D says when, oh gosh, this one's got two as well. This one wants me to do negative F of X plus three. Remember, we've got to do what's in the parentheses first before we can multiply what's outside the parentheses. So what we're gonna do is this actually shifts, we're just gonna do f of x plus three first, and then we'll do the y. So this is gonna shift the graph left three units. So what does that do? It means I'm gonna take my x values and I'm gonna minus three. I don't even remember what the x values were. Okay, there we go. So we're going to take negative six and we're going to, uh, it's going to go left, we're going to minus three. Then negative three comma zero, zero comma five, um, three comma zero, six comma negative four. So then I get negative nine comma negative four, negative six comma zero, negative three comma five, zero comma zero, um, three comma negative four. And then I need to do the negative. So we need to put the negative on the outside because there were two transformations here. So in this case, this is going to reflect. So it's gonna make the Y values change sign. So I'm gonna have negative six comma negative four, negative three comma zero, zero comma five, three comma zero and six comma negative four. And so remember, we're gonna change the sign of these guys. So they become negative six comma four, negative three comma zero, zero comma negative five, three comma zero, and six comma positive four. And so I'm gonna look for those on this function that would be negative six comma four, it's too high, too low. Okay, this one maybe, no, not negative six. Negative six, no. So it should have moved it to the left and then it should have reflected it. So, Let's look at zero and negative five. Hmm. Maybe I needed to apply my reflection first, but no, it doesn't matter because the Y values will still be negative. So if I flipped it first and then went left, it should be here. So negative six. Oh, what am I thinking? I should have been manipulating these points, not the original points. So these points should have been, I should have been taking these because that's what the last transformation I left off. I applied this transformation. Now I'm trying to take that and apply the last transformation. So I should have been using these points, okay? So you use this X value and then change the sign of that Y value. Use this same X value, but then change the sign of the Y value. This X value, exactly as it was, change the sign of the Y value. 
x value, change the sign of the y, x value, change the sign of the y. So then here, I actually get positive nine comma four, um, negative six, negative three, zero, and three. And so we do have two graphs that intersect at zero, zero, right? This guy here. Um, but then the other point is gonna be um, negative nine, negative nine comma four and negative nine comma four is over here, there's nothing. So it's gotta be this way. Now E. When the negative's on the inside, you're gonna make the X values negative. So the original would have been negative six comma negative four, um, negative three comma zero, zero comma five, three comma zero, and six comma negative four. But because of the X being negative on the inside, we're gonna put the negative on all the X values. So this becomes six comma negative four, three comma zero, zero comma five, three negative three comma zero, and negative six comma negative four. So notice the points basically reflected themselves. Those are the same, and then those are reflected. Oops. So it literally is the same graph. Okay, I took all of the original points and I just made those X values negative like it shows there. And we ended up with these points. But notice that this original point matches what it became, right? Then this original point matches this one that it became. Zero and negative five is still, or zero and five is still the same. This is negative three and zero like it was originally. And this is negative six, negative four, like it was originally. So essentially the graph looks exactly the way it looked before. So that means it's going to look like this one because the original graph had a point at zero five. My goodness, this problem never ends. It has a lot of good teaching points in it though, so it's okay f of x minus seven. This is gonna shift downward. Seven units. So what does that mean? That means I need to subtract seven from all my y values. So negative six, negative four, negative three comma zero, three comma, oh, no, nope, I missed one. Zero comma five three comma zero, and then six comma negative four. And now because I'm shifting downward, I'm gonna actually subtract seven from each of these Y values. So this becomes negative six comma negative 11, negative three comma negative seven, zero negative two, three negative seven, six, negative 11. And so then I'm gonna plot these points and see which one. Zero, negative two is what I'm looking at. It looks like it matches this one. This is the only graph that has this middle um, point, negative two. So negative six, negative 11, um, negative three, negative seven, that right there, so on and so forth. Okay, so it's gotta be this one. Now let's work on G and that's finally the last one in this section. So for G, they want Y equals one half of X on the inside of F, okay? So what you're gonna do is the opposite of what's happening to X in here. So instead of uh, multiplying by a half, we're gonna divide by a half, which is the same thing as multiplying by two. So we're gonna take um, all of our X values, negative six, negative three, zero, three, and six,
and you're going to multiply them by two. And so your coordinates become negative 12 comma negative four, negative six comma zero, zero comma five, six comma zero and 12 comma negative four. And so let's find those points. Zero five is on two graphs, okay? Now negative 12 and negative four is here. Whereas this one, there's nothing at negative 12. So it must be this graph. Okay, we finally got through that section. Moving on. For 23, it says use the graph of x squared, which is shown here, or no, just use the graph of x squared to write an equation for this function. Now the regular x squared is supposed to be here and then it's supposed to have a point at, neg at one, negative one and negative one, one. So one, one and negative one, one. And that's what the original is supposed to look like. But if you notice, this one has been moved down um, one box, two boxes, three boxes. So it's moved down three units. And that's pretty much all that's happened to it. It didn't reflect because it's still facing upward and it didn't shift left or right. So because all it did was go down, the equation is going to be x minus three, x squared, sorry, minus three. Now for part B, for part B, it did flip upside down. It's supposed to look like this and it flipped upside down. But even if I were to flip it upside down, it would still have the points one, negative one, negative one, negative one. Um, but notice that the little peak here, the vertex has been shifted. It's been shifted over one box and then shifted up four boxes. So it went up four and also went to the left one, okay? And it reflected. Okay, in order for me to do the reflection, that means I'm gonna have to have a negative on the outside of the square. Uh, because I'm going up, I'm gonna have plus four outside the square. And because I'm moving left, I'm gonna have X plus one on the inside of the square. You remember the ones on the inside go the opposite of what you think. Even though we know positives are to the right, it's opposite of what you think when it's in the parentheses. So then that's the equation I'm gonna write here. Negative parentheses x plus one, close, raise it, square plus four. Now 24, it says now use the graph of x cubed. Now x cubed, let's zero, zero, one, one, and then negative one, negative one. So it goes like half parabola that way a half parabola this way. Now this one, if you notice where the little center is, this one actually took the center and went up one, two, three. So in that case, if it's going up three units, it's gonna be X to the third and then plus three. If it were down, it'd be minus three. Here, the little center went to the left one unit and down one unit. So we already know in order to go left, Yes, in order to go left, we're gonna have to do the opposite, which is add three or add two, because it went to the left two. And then it also went down one, which means I'm gonna do minus one. But it also reflected, Note, look at my graph. It goes up on the right side and down on the left. And this one is doing the opposite. It's going down on the right side and up on the left. So we have to put a minus sign in the front to make it flip. Okay. Now, number 25, we're using the graph of absolute value, but in order for us to do that, we need to know absolute value has the same points like the parabola, but it doesn't have the same shape. 
it's linear. So it's going straight lines in this direction. So instead of looking like a U, it looks more like a V. But if you notice one, it reflected downward here and two, it moved back one, two, three, four. So it went left four, it reflected and it did not move up or down because it's still on top of the X axis. So moving left is gonna make me do X plus four inside the bars. And the reflection is gonna make me put a minus in the front of the bars. Now you don't need those parentheses. So I'm just going to enter X plus four. There we go, got those bars in there. Now here, it did not reflect, but it did go over to the right one, which means I'm gonna do X minus one. And then it went down to three units. So we're gonna do minus three on the outside. Here it asks us to transform the square root of X. So originally for 26, the square root of X is supposed to have the points one, one, and one, two, three, four, two. Okay, so it should look like a sideways half parabola. Now, this one did not flip, but obviously it went down one, two, three, four, five, six units. So it went down six, but then it also went to the left too. So that means I'm going to have, instead of square root of X, I'm gonna have a square root of X, left means plus two, and down means minus six on the outside of the radical. So we're gonna get square root of X plus two. And then we're gonna have minus six on the outside. Now it looks like I have extra square root. There we go. Now B does look like it flipped downward, okay? So it does have a reflection, but then even after I flip downward from the original, it would go this direction, starting at the origin and go here. So it obviously went down five units and it went to the right two units. So reflection means a negative on the outside. Right means I'm gonna do X minus two on the inside. And then down means I'm gonna do minus five on the outside. So this is gonna be minus square root X minus two, get out of there, minus six. Oh, sorry, minus five. I was looking at that one, but I needed to be looking at this one. Okay, getting down to our very last few problems here. So 27. Twenty-seven says, um, if you have these two functions here, evaluate f of um, f plus g of two. So f plus g of two is the same as saying f of two plus g of two, which means plug in two to f and plug in two to g. So you get two plus three, two squared minus two. Two plus three is just five. Here we get four minus two, which is two. And if you add five and two, you get seven. And so this should just be seven. Now for 26, or I'm sorry, I'm going backwards, 28, we have f g of negative four, which means f of negative four times g of negative four. So if I plug in negative four into f, it's going to be negative four plus three. And if I plug negative four into G, it's going to be negative four squared minus two. So then my computations inside here will give me a negative one. And in here I get 16 minus two, which is 14. And negative one times 14 is negative 14. Now for 29, this says f of x equals x squared plus seven. 
and g of x equals the square root of two minus x. And it asks me for f plus g, f minus g, so on and so forth. So f plus g is just f of x plus g of x, which means it's this function plus this function, which you don't really need the parentheses for because there's no coefficient of that parentheses and no exponent of that parentheses. Then you have f minus g, which is f of x minus g of x, which is the f function minus the g function. And so we don't need those parentheses again. We just get this expression. Now f g of x, that means f of x times g of x. So here we have x squared plus seven times two minus x. And that one, I would just leave it like that. And then finally, f over g is the same as saying f of x over g of x. So that's the same as saying x squared plus seven over the square root of two minus x, okay? Now it's asking me for the domain of f over g. So we have to consider the domain of f. f is just no fractions, no radicals. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. Here though, you have a radical and you know that that radicand has to be greater than or equal to zero. If I minus two over, I get negative x has to be greater than or greater than or equal to negative two. If I divide by a negative one, this is gonna flip and I get that x has to be less than two. Okay, so the domain of G is negative infinity to two with the two included. If I wanna find the domain of F intersected with the domain of G, what the two sets have in common, this one has everything and this one only has this chunk. So of course, what they're gonna have in common is the chunk. So this is my combined domain F and G. But the domain of F over G is the domain of f intersect the domain of g minus any x values where g equals zero. So in my case, it would be this interval minus whenever g is equal to zero. Well, what is gonna make g equal to zero? g equals zero when this thing equals zero. And if I square both sides, it's really when this equals zero. And if I minus two, when negative x equals negative two, or if I divide by negative one, when x just equals positive two. So I'm going to have to remove the two, which means that this bracket will not be around that two anymore because I'm removing it from the list. And so this becomes that domain. So bear with me, I'm gonna type all this in here. Square, oops x squared plus seven plus square root two minus and then x squared plus seven minus square root two minus x. Then when I multiplied, I just got x squared plus seven root of two minus x. And an extra square root, there you go. Now for that one, we got a fraction and we got x squared plus seven over the square root of two minus x. And then for the domain, we got sets, both parentheses, negative, infinity symbol, comma, two. Okay, and finally our last problem, which is similar to the other one, but of course it can have different values because they're different functions. So this one has f of x equals x over x plus one, g of x equal to x cubed. 
And so f plus g of x is the same as f of x plus g of x, which is the same as saying this plus this. Now you can get a common denominator. And so you end up with x plus x cubed times x plus one over x plus one, this common denominator or x plus x to the fourth plus x cubed if you distribute the x cubed. You have to multiply before you can add, okay? But now that I have multiplied that x cubed, I can add, but they can't really be combined because none of them are like terms. I'm just writing them in order, okay? But this would be what I type in for f plus g. f minus g is very similar, f of x minus g of x, which is this guy minus this guy. And I can do the same thing again, multiply the second term to get the common denominator. This would become this expression all over that common denominator. But now I have a negative one that I have to distribute. So it becomes x minus x to the fourth minus x cubed. And so, um, I mean, I could rearrange it, but the positive guy's already in front. So I'm just gonna leave this one like this. Now, times, let's see how that's gonna work, times. F, um, it says f g of x. That means f of x times g of x. So I'm gonna have this function times x cubed. I can put this over one and I get x to the fourth over x plus one. Then f over g of x is f of x over g of x. Or another way of writing that is f of x times one over g of x, right? Um, and the reason why I'm going to do that is because one of them is already a fraction, okay? So if I write it like this, remember top times top, imaginary bottom times bottom, you'll get this fraction, okay? But f of x is a fraction itself already, so it helps to write them next to each other, and g of x is x cubed. And then you notice this x actually cancels one of those x's, and so we end up with one in the numerator and x plus one times an x squared, which you can distribute. So you get one over x cubed plus x squared. And it asked me for the domain of g. So first the domain of f. We know that in fractions, your denominator cannot equal zero. So that means x plus one cannot equal zero. If I minus one, that means x cannot equal negative one. So what does that interval look like for the domain of f? It's negative infinity to negative one and negative one to infinity. Everything but that negative one, okay? For G, G doesn't have any fractions or radicals or anything. So the domain of G is gonna be negative infinity to infinity. Now, this set of values is smaller than this set of values because it's missing that one number, right? But when I'm trying to figure out what they have in common, they basically have everything in common except for that one number. So my interval is gonna be negative one, negative infinity to negative one, and then negative one to infinity. But if I wanna find the domain of F over G, I have to find when this intersection, and then I gotta remove where G equals zero. So that means I'm gonna take negative infinity to negative one union, negative one to infinity, and I'm gonna remove any values that make G zero. Remember, G is X cubed. And so if I take the cube root on both sides, I just get that that happens when X is equal to zero. So I'm gonna remove the value zero from this interval. Oh gosh, what is that gonna do to the interval? That means I have negative infinity to negative one still, but then this chunk is gonna break up into two chunks. It's gonna be from negative one to zero, but then from zero to infinity. 
Okay. And now you have removed the zero from the interval as well. And so this is going to be what we type in there. So bear with me, I gotta type all of this stuff in there. Um, fraction, we have x to the fourth plus x to the third plus x over x plus one. Here we had x minus x to the fourth minus x to the third over x plus one. Here for fg we had x to the fourth over x plus one. And the last one we had um, one over x to the third plus x to the two. And then for our domain, we had um, sets. We had this down here. So we had this and then a union and then another one of these and then another union, and then another one of those. So we're gonna go negative infinity comma negative one, negative one comma zero, and then zero comma infinity. And there we have it. We have finished our review. So hopefully this helps as you try to work on these problems on your own. Again, none of the pictures are gonna be exactly the same. Um, and none of the functions are gonna be exactly the same on your test, on your review, or if these similar problems are on a test, on that test, okay? Um, all the values can be different, but hopefully this does give you some, uh, uh, a little bit of confidence in when you're working out these problems so that you can get these values. But I am done and we will, um, we'll move on to the next unit very shortly after this test.